what we give them is a banana flavored nutrient pellet which comes down comes down through this chute here drops out into basically a sort of a fireplace in front of the animal um, after this the animal then proceeds to press left or right hand levers okay, initially when, when the animal has been put into the boxes um, we have seven or eight boxes within the laboratory every animal would go into the boxes and then the doors would be closed the idea being that the animal cannot see what's going on other than what's inside the box the box is illuminated at all times uh, to keep an idea as to what's going on, we would then go to the computer room and watch the animals on a monitor. It's, it's impossible to see what's going on in all the boxes at any one time, although there is a spy hole here whereby you could just check to see that the animal's working okay. And there you see the animal having a really good look around the box. And then hopefully going towards the food chute. So we would expect initially for a completely naive animal to have learnt the idea of lever pressing within seven days. The rat may take a long time to actually move towards and press the lever. And this can be speeded up by using shaping techniques known as successive approximations. These same techniques are used by animal trainers in shows, circuses and advertising. You could use them to teach your pets some tricks, bearing in mind the ethical guidelines for dealing with animals. The animal needs to be hungry, and the reinforcer, if it's going to be food, should be given in small amounts, for obvious reasons. The idea is to gradually increase the requirements for receiving a reinforcer until your animal reaches the desired response. An example using rats in Skinner boxes would be that as soon as the animal moves in the direction of the lever, a pellet is delivered. Then a nearer approximation to the desired behavior is required before reinforcement, such as waiting until it moves nearer the lever. Then it's required that the lever is actually touched before reinforcement. And finally, the lever must be pressed for reinforcement. The rat should then continue pressing until it can eat no more or is satiated. If not, you can repeat the process, which due to past learning should take less time. It's here that classical and operant conditioning can operate together, because presumably the association between the lever and food is a classical one, using the autonomic nervous system which controls internal physiological responses, such as hunger rather than the central nervous system involved in the act of lever pressing. Want the money out of the cell now! I'm going to call the police. Everyday memory, by its very nature, has to be studied where and when it is happening. And that has to be outside the laboratory, in real life situations. Earlier in the video, you watched a short scene of a robbery. Before we go any further, Answer the following questions. What was the shopkeeper doing when the robbers entered the shop? 
Did the robber in trainers enter the shop first? How old were the youths who robbed the shop? What weapon did the second attacker hit the male shopper with? Did the shopkeeper shout for help before or after the till was opened? At what stage did the witness lose his glasses? What direction did the car turn in to make its getaway? What we have just done is to investigate eyewitness testimony by means of a naturalistic study. That is, we have attempted to look at a real life, everyday situation. So what concerns us is firstly, how accurately you could recall the details of the scene. And secondly, was your memory distorted by the way the questions were framed? Let's just watch the scene again so that you can check your answers. Want the money out of the till now! I'm going to call the police. Remember that earlier we discussed the stories of Bartlett, who suggested that we reconstruct events by trying to make them fit into our already existing schema. Classic studies in this area were carried out by Elizabeth Loftus in the 1970s, who based her work on Bartlett's and applied it to eyewitness testimony. She showed that when questioned about past events, the way the question is worded has a significant effect on what is remembered. One of the best examples of this was when participants were shown a film of a car accident. Those asked afterwards, did you see the broken headlight, said yes twice as frequently as those who were asked, did you see a broken headlight. This type of research obviously has implications for real police interviews and leading questions in court cases although some recent research on witnesses to real events suggests that the effect of leading questions is not as great as the work of Loftus suggested. Autobiographical memory is another aspect of everyday memory which is currently being studied. These memories relate to episodes in our lives usually relating to specific times or places. For example, you may remember a day out at the zoo when you were younger because you were frightened by one of the animals. If that experience is encountered several times shortly afterwards, then the individual episode loses its individuality and merges into a series of common features or schema which are held in our semantic memory. 
On the whole, trivial events, such as what you have in your sandwiches, tend to be forgotten, while emotionally significant events, such as your first kiss, are remembered in vivid detail. These are sometimes called flashbulb memories. We have looked at just a few of the many ways that everyday memory can be studied. There's been a lot of research into the question of how babies actually make the link between objects, actions and words. Jerome Bruner stated that babies learn the pattern of familiar routines, for example meal times, and can remember them in some way. This may be why they're upset by strangers who do things in an unpredictable manner. The baby's knowledge of these social routines is what enables it to crack the code of the language which accompanies social interaction. Jerome Bruner also saw language development in terms of a way for children to solve problems, such as, how can I get mum to give me a drink? Halliday suggested that language development was all part of children's attempts to master and influence their world. For example, to get people to do things and bring things to them. Margaret Harris spent many hours watching mothers and babies together. She found that mothers predicted what the children were about to do and they would put this into words. So just as the child thought of knocking over the bricks, mother would say, are you going to knock them all down? Harris showed that 80% of mother's utterances at the age of 16 months referred to the object on which the child was focusing as she spoke. Interestingly, she also noted that mothers of slow language developers didn't get this timing exactly right. She also suggested that the reason why blind children's language is delayed is that they lack this visual context for word learning. Once the child has grasped the idea of using words, there is then a stage of vocabulary learning where parents actively teach the names of things. That's the man. The man. There is then a very rapid stage of word acquisition. We'll move on to this stage after we've looked at the theories. Behavioural psychologists such as B.F. Skinner believe that children learn language by the process of imitation and that this is shaped by operant conditioning. That is, parents are constantly rewarding or reinforcing the child's attempts to imitate speech. Hello, duck. Although imitation does play some part in language, especially in acquiring vocabulary, it's obviously not the whole story. For example, children create original sentences and say things which they've never heard adults say. How do you do that? Um, a frog over. Mm. And a fly the kite. They buy the new house, doesn't it? It does. It got stuck in a roof. Some of the rules of grammar that children have to acquire are actually very complicated and they're easier to use than explain. You can see now why adults would find it very difficult to explain the rules of language to children. In any case, adult speech has many grammatical errors in it, so children don't necessarily hear good language. It seems then that imitation can't be the only way that children acquire language. The other possibility is that language is innate. Noam Chomsky proposed that children are biologically pre-programmed to acquire language. He suggested that children have what he called a language acquisition device, which helps them to acquire the rules of grammar. He claimed that the deep structure of all languages is the same, and therefore an inherited language acquisition device is universal. This could explain the fact that all children go through the same language stages and tend to make the same language mistakes instead of simply mimicking adults. We also know from brain studies that there are specialized areas of the brain responsible for language processing. The primary auditory area receives a signal from the ear 
and transmits it via nerve fibres to Wernicke's area in the left temporal lobe, which is related to understanding of language. This is then transmitted to Broca's area on the left